So today I'll be reviewing a book titled Amusing Ourselves to Death, written in 1985 by Neil Postman. So this is a critique of modern communication. It's a book about how TV has made our culture dumber. This book explains how TV has polluted our minds, how TV and ideology have gradually eroded people's ability to think, the decay in public discourse and debate in America, and how TV unconsciously reinforces a neoliberal hyper-consumerism ideology. This book answers the question, are we living in 1984? The old history, a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests, obeying The quick answer is no. We are actually living in the brave new world. Although this was written in 1985, it is still extremely relevant today. Most of his critiques center around television. However, the internet has only amplified the problems outlined in this book. In 1985, the president was a former Hollywood actor, Ronald Reagan. This is true today with Donald Trump. One unique note about the author is he comes from a Christian perspective and has some interesting examples to provide. Also, Neil Postman is not a Luddite. He's not anti-technology or anti-science. He's making the argument from a philosophical and epistemological point of view. TV is meant to entertain us, not inform us. Think of sensationalism, sound bites, and clickbait. Postman outlines several major transitions that have taken place within our culture due to television. The transformation from a word-centered culture to an image-centered culture. The transformation from the age of exposition to the age of show business. A transition where reading promoted critical thinking to where we're passively entertained by TV. One thing I really appreciated about Postman's writing style is how well he summarized each paragraph at the end, which I'll be taking several quotes from. So Postman starts out by making the distinction between 1984 and the brave new world and claims that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. Contrary to common belief, even among the educated, Huxley and Orwell did not prophesize the same thing. Orwell warns that we'll be overcome by an externally opposed oppression, but in Huxley's vision, no big brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As he saw it, people will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture. In Orwell's vision, culture becomes a prison. In Huxley's vision, culture becomes a burlesque. One of the major central themes of this book is a quote by Marshall McLuhan that reads, The medium is the message. On page six, he says, Our attention here is on how forms of public discourse regulate and even dictate what kind of content can issue from such forms of technology. He gives the example of a primitive technology of smoke signals. He says, I can safely guess it did not include philosophical argument. You cannot use smoke to do philosophy. Its form excludes the content. Postman goes on later to talk about the news of the day, which was entirely created by the telegraph and since amplified by newer media, which made it possible to move decontextualized information over vast spaces at incredible speed. The news of the day is a figment of our technological imagination. It is quite precisely a media event. We attend to fragments of events all over the world because we have multiple media whose forms are well suited to fragmented conversation. Fragmented conversation. Fragmented conversation. He then explains from a somewhat historical materialism perspective how paintings evolved into hieroglyphs, which evolved into alphabet writing, which evolved into the printing press, which evolved into TV, and how these communication technologies affect our worldview or ideology. He then gives the example of the clock, 
and how a clock creates the idea of moment to moment. It is a social construct. It has no conception of long-term thinking, such as seasons, generations, centuries. Plato says that the alphabet was the beginning of philosophy. Philosophy cannot exist without criticism, and writing makes it possible. Chapter 2 is about epistemology, or the study of knowledge, and how our communication mediums define and regulate our ideas of truth. TV creates new forms of truth-telling. He then uses the metaphor of a polluted river to explain public discourse. A river that has slowly been polluted suddenly becomes toxic. Most of the fish perish. Swimming becomes a danger to health. But even then, the river may look the same, and one may still take a boat ride on it. In other words, even when life has been taken from it, the river does not disappear, nor do all of its uses. But its value has been seriously diminished, and its degraded condition will have harmful effects throughout the landscape. We are now in a culture whose information, ideas, and epistemology are given form by television. Television-based epistemology pollutes public communication. Chapter 3 explains how during the American Revolution, America was founded by intellectuals. Literacy rates were very high. The public was much smarter back then than it is today. America was a reading culture. He gives the example of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, how it sold more than 100,000 copies the same year it was published. He extrapolates that to 8 million copies in two months in 1985. On page 35, he says, the only communication event that could produce such collective attention in today's America is the Super Bowl. In chapter 4, Postman continues with more historical examples. During the times of the Civil War, this was the golden age of American literature. Mark Twain, Walt Whitman, Thoreau, Emerson, Poe, just to name a few. They were grandsons and granddaughters of the Enlightenment. He explains how the nature of debates between Lincoln and Douglas were very long. In some cases, debates would last up to seven hours. Compare that to today where presidential candidates only have a minute or two to respond in debates. Postman suggests that the Gettysburg Address would probably be largely incomprehensible to a 1985 audience. Postman then goes on to explain the epistemological crisis of the time and how churches fought back and actually founded many American colleges including Harvard, Yale, University of Tennessee, George Washington, Wake Forest. He then goes on to describe the descent of the typographic mind, how reason and understanding decayed into entertainment and appealing to passions and emotions. He gives the example of advertisements, how they began to incorporate slogans, musical jingles, rhymes, pictures of babies, Advertising became one part depth psychology and one part aesthetic theory. Chapter 5 is about the time-space compression. In the 1840s, information could only move as fast as a human being could carry it, or as fast as a train on the railroad, which was about 30 miles an hour. Today, information moves at light speed. On page 65 through 67, he says, The telegraph made information into a commodity. We're living in an age of information glut. We're drowning in a sea of information. Most of our daily news is inert, gives us something to talk about, but cannot lead to meaningful action. It says, voting. It's hardly a satisfying means of expressing the broad range of opinions you hold. Photos are just decontextualized images, isolated, atomized. He then explains how the media invents context to create pseudo events as a means of diversion. On page 76, he says, pseudo contest is a structure invented to give fragmented and irrelevant information to a seeming use, left with no genuine connection to our lives. A culture overwhelmed by irrelevance, incoherence, and impotence. On page 79 and 80, he starts talking about worldview or ideology. Ideology, Postman says, is a way of thinking so deeply embedded in our consciousness that it is invisible. Television has gradually become our culture, the background radiation of the social and intellectual universe. Television's conversations promote incoherence and triviality. Television speaks in only one persistent voice, the voice of entertainment. Chapter 6 is the age of show business. On page 84, 
He states, only those who know nothing of the history of technology believe that a technology is entirely neutral. He gives a funny example. One is reminded of George Bernard Shaw's remark on his first seeing the glittering neon signs of Broadway and 42nd Street at night. It must be beautiful, he said, if you cannot read. Entertainment is the supra ideology of all discourse on television. He then gives a few examples of how TV tried to appear more serious. Firing Line with William Buckley, The Day After, Sesame Street. He then gives another few examples of how teachers began to use gimmicks in the classroom. For example, rock music to teach math and history. And then regarding debates today, he says on page 97, the men were less concerned with giving arguments than with giving off impressions. And the winner of the debate was determined by the style of the men, how they looked, fixed their gaze, smiled, and delivered one-liners. Look at those hands. Are they small hands? <laughs> and he referred to my hands. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee it. Chapter 7 is about how credibility has replaced reality. This reminds me of the hyperreal as described by Baudrillard in his book Simulacra and Simulation. On page 101 he says, The perception of the truth of a report rests heavily on the acceptability of the newscaster. On 102 he continues, Credibility is the impression of sincerity, authenticity, vulnerability, or attractiveness. Politicians nowadays are no longer concerned about reality. Think about political promises, lies, Donald Trump. News, he defines on page 103, is a stylized dramatic performance whose content has been staged largely to entertain. He then goes on to say how the incorporation of advertisements into the news refutes any claim that television news is designed as a serious form of public discourse. Imagine what you would think of me and this book if I were to pause here, tell you that I'll return to my discussion in a moment, and then proceed to write a few words on behalf of United Airlines, or Chase Bank, or I'll be right back after this word from Burger King. You would rightly think that I had no respect for you, and certainly no respect for the subject. Why do we not hold news to the same standards? Americans should be outraged at what these media corporations have done. Fake news is real. There's definitely something that stings. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all, all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish things that simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. On page 105, he says, the goal of TV is to keep everything brief, not to strain the attention of anyone, but instead to provide constant stimulation through variety, novelty, action, and movement. Bite size is best. That complexity must be avoided. That nuances are dispensable. Regarding the new show, the weatherman is comic relief. The sportscaster is there to relate to the beer drinking common man. You guys hear about the caps? No? You like to drink? I like to drink. I'm going to drink the whole show. He ends the chapter noting how American culture valorizes celebrities. For example, Entertainment Tonight. They try to create serious conversations around entertainers and celebrities. Scott Osborne was there. <laughs> the nation's TV critics meeting in Phoenix confronted Joan Rivers this past weekend, and Joan won. Chapter 8 is about the electronic church. Postman, again, comes from a Christian background and he's not happy about TV. He says something is lost in translation as the communication medium transformed onto the television. On page 118, he says, TV makes authentic religion experience impossible. If the audience is not immersed in an aura of mystery and in symbolic otherworldliness, then it is unlikely that it can call forth the state of mind required for non-trivial religious experience. This is interesting in 1985, given the fact that Reagan was president and ushering the revival of the U.S. Christian right. On page 119-120, Postman states, The television screen itself has a long bias towards 
a psychology of secularism. Commercials, promos for popular shows, and a variety of other secular images and discourses. So that the main message of the screen itself is a continual promise of entertainment. This works against the idea of introspection or spiritual transcendence. He then goes on to list several celebrity preachers and their use of modern marketing techniques. One provides two free Jesus first pins to their Patreons. He makes a distinction between want versus need. On page 121 he says, there is no great religious leader from Buddha to Moses to Jesus to Muhammad to Luther who offer people what they want only what they need. Chapter 9 is about how politics has become a spectator sport in America. He gives a quote by Reagan, who said, politics is just like show business. On page 126, he says, the main business is to please the crowd. The idea is not to pursue excellence, clarity, or honesty, but to appear as if you are. Business expenditures have shifted from product research to market research. He goes on to critique Orwell in his book 1984. On page 129 he says, his contempt was aimed at those politicians who would use sophisticated versions of age-old arts of double-think propaganda and deceit. That the defense of the indefensible would conduct as a form of amusement did not occur to him. He feared the politician as a deceiver, not as entertainer. He goes on to say how TV and commercial culture provides instant therapy, instant gratification creates the illusion that all problems are solvable, the quick fix. He goes on to talk about how image politics started with JFK and Nixon on TV, how politicians started doing commercials. You know me, I ran for vice president of the United States in 64. That's why I carry an American Express card. He says books are pure history, but on page, on page 136 he says, TV is a speed of light medium, present centered, permits no access to the past. Everything presented in moving pictures is experienced as happening now. In the age of show business and image politics, public discourse is emptied not only of ideological content, but historical content as well. On the next page he says, a sense of irrelevance that leads to the diminution of history. We become agitated amnesiacs. We Americans seem to know everything about the last 24 hours, but very little of the last 60 centuries or the last 60 years. With media whose structure is biased towards furnishing images and fragments, we are deprived of access to an historical perspective. 1984 envisioned the demolition of history, but believed that it would be accomplished by the state. The Ministry of Truth would systematically banish inconvenient facts and destroy the records of the past. Huxley, in Brave New World, suggests seemingly benign technology is devoted to providing the populace with the politics of image, instancy, and therapy may disappear history just as effectively, perhaps more permanently, and without objection. Postman then goes on to talk about censorship. Whatever dangers there may be in a word that is written, such a word is a hundred times more dangerous when stamped by a press. Monarchs knew this well. In a world of printing, information is the gunpowder of the mind. Hence come the censors in their austere robes to dampen the explosion. He then ends the chapter talking about the US Constitution and how our founding fathers, like Orwell, were worried about government tyranny. But on page 193, he states, the founding fathers did not foresee that tyranny by government may be superseded by another sort of problem altogether, namely the corporate state, which through television now controls the flow of public discourse in America. He quotes George Gerbner, Television is the new state religion run by a private ministry of culture, the three networks, offering a universal curriculum for all people, financed by a form of hidden taxation without representation. You pay when you wash, not when you watch and whether or not you care to watch. Postman states, we have no way of protecting ourselves from information disseminated by corporate America. On page 141, tyrants of all varieties have always known about the value of providing masses with amusement as a means of pacifying discontent. But most of them could not have even hoped for a situation in which the masses would ignore that which does not amuse. This is why tyrants have always relied and still do on censorship. How delighted with all the kings, czars, and furs of the past, and commissaires of the present, to know that censorship is not a necessity when all political discourse takes the form of a jest. 
Chapter 10 is about teaching and how education has become entertainment. He gives the example of Sesame Street and how this was embraced by children because they were raised on television commercials. Parents embraced it too, out of guilt. He says on page 142 that they could not or would not restrict their children's access to television. Sesame appeared to justify allowing a four or five year old to sit transfixed in front of a TV screen for unnatural periods of time. Again, from a historical materialism perspective, Postman points to three key thinkers to understand the epistemological shifts that took place with each transformation in communication technology. Reading Plato will help you best understand the transformation from oral tradition to alphabet writing. Reading Locke will help you best understand the transformation from alphabet writing to the printing press. And McLuhan will help you best understand the transformation from the printing press to TV. Unfortunately, our education system never caught up with epistemology or technology. Unfortunately, capitalism cares more about profit than people. Our schools today are antiquated, outdated institutions. They are the ideological state apparatus as described by Althusser. They were created during the period of Fordism, designed to produce obedient factory line workers, not critical thinkers. Postman states that TV forms of education cannot replace the social interactions of the classroom. He then outlines TV's three commandments. One, no prerequisite knowledge required. Two, no perplexity. And three, avoid exposition like the plague. That's why TV is loaded with storytelling, dynamic images, and music. He then gives this insane example of a 15-part TV show called Voyage of the Mimi, which apparently is how Ben Affleck became a child celebrity. This was a $3.65 million attempt to merge education with entertainment, where kids learn useless information about the behavior of humpback whales, navigation, and map reading skills. And what's that called? Lobtailing. Mark that down, Arthur. Listen to the noise they make with their flute. We don't know why they do that either. Obsolete academic themes not found in the classroom. He says on page 153, I would suggest that the voyage of the Mimi was conceived by someone asking the question, what is television good for, not what is education good for? They spent $3.65 million for the purpose of using media exactly the manner that media merchants want them to be used, mindlessly and invisibly. In the last chapter, Postman again reasserts that Huxley was right, not Orwell. He says on page 155, What we fear is more likely to come from an enemy with a smiling face than from one whose countenance excludes suspicion and hate. Big Brother does not watch us by his choice. We watch him by ours. There is no need for wardens or gates or ministries of truth. When a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, those who speak about this manner must often raise their voices to a near hysterical pitch. Truth tellers such as Assange or Snowden are depicted as crazy, traitors, or conspiracy theorists, and they do not receive proper coverage in the mainstream media. Postman alludes to the idea of inner passivity. On page 162, he says, The act of criticism itself would, in the end, be co-opted by television. He states that this neoliberal ideological revolution happened without a vote, without polemics, without guerrilla resistance. The 1984 Orwellian world is much easier to recognize as we are conditioned to resist a prison when the gates are being closed around us. Postman critiques the technocratic, neoliberal, utopian vision of capitalism that technology will eventually solve all our problems. He says on page 157, To be unaware that a technology comes equipped with a program for social change, to maintain that technology is neutral, to make the assumption that technology is always a friend to culture is, at this late hour, stupidity, plain and simple. Reading Marx and understanding surplus value and exploitation is key to understanding why this neoliberal ideological position is a fantasy. Capitalism demands continuous exploitation of a working class to achieve the continuous growth it requires. 
We had the technology and wealth a hundred years ago to feed the world, but accumulation in the hands of the few will always prevent this kind of technocratic, neoliberal, utopian vision we are unconsciously force-fed from childhood. Postman offers a few solutions, but he's not optimistic. For example, parody or satire such as SNL. One of my favorite examples is Jimmy Dore. He says on page 160, the problem in any case does not reside in what people watch. The problem is in that we watch. If you enjoyed this leftist critique of communication technologies, several other books I could recommend that are similar include Bouldriard's Simulacra and Simulation, Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle, Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism, Is There No Alternative, and of course Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. Thanks for tuning in to my first book review, and we'll see you next time. And there's definitely something that stings 